first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge that the land that we're on today is the traditional land of the Gaona people, and I respect their elders past and present and their spiritual relationship with their country. And I would like to thank the Gawler History Team for inviting me to speak. Thank you. My talk this evening relates to the very different experiences of the people of, the, of German descent in the Barossa Valley during both world wars. I have to admit to having some difficulty in researching the second part of this talk, as it's been a very neglected, but I think an important part of the history of the Barossa Valley, albeit a bit confronting, but more of that later. In the First World War, Australian citizens of German descent were treated badly, very badly actually, by both state and federal governments, as well as the non-German descent community in which they lived. Despite this, many of those same German descent people had fathers, sons, brothers, sweethearts fighting in the Australian army. The irony is awful. In that war, many were also interned, abused and mistreated, often members of the same family. The violence, the deprivation, alienation and isolation of World War I internees experienced to varying degrees, depending on who had interned them and when, has been to a large extent ignored by the wider media. Internment as a reality of war has somehow been glossed over to the public <coughs> consciousness. Understandably, the far worse suffering of those who died or survived in World War II concentration camps or prisoner of war camps have deservedly had a much greater impact on the world's awareness. So who were interned in Australia, especially South Australia, and why? Despite pledges of loyalty from the German community here and calls for tolerance from the state premier at the time, who was Archibald Peak, on the 10th of August 1914, five days after Australia entered that war, all German subjects living or visiting here had to report to their local police station. In World War I, these were naturalised British subjects from, nation, from enemy nations, that's part of them. Some were Australian-born citizens, or others who in the eyes of the authorities, in inverted commas, posed a threat. Almost all of them were of German descent. In World War II, however, this selection altered. There were concerns about German fifth colonists and Nazi sympathisers who had arrived in the intervening years, in the 20s mainly, those who threatened Australian safety or defence, and those needing to be locked up to allay public concerns. That's nice and vague. And any internee sent here from other countries, and among those, uh, this is a sort of a side issue because it's not directly connected to the Barossa, but there was a group called the Danira Boys, named from the ship, the Danira, that they were transported to Australia on. A, a very unfortunate group, and I'll talk about them a bit later. Internment camps are a reality, and probably have been since, the, since war has become part of human behaviour. But not much is known about them. As access to world information improved last century, it became harder to hide the truth. In the 20th century, the more widely known camps were run by the British in the Boer War, where thousands of Afrikaans, mainly women and children, died. And those run in World, War, World, sorry, World Wars I and II by the Germans and the Japanese, all were shockingly brutal places in which millions of people died. By the time the world had embarked on World War I, internment of enemy aliens was an established form of control worldwide of the perceived internal threat from alien 
nationals, in inverted commas, despite the fact that the vast majority, as in the case of the Barossa Valley, of those nationals were often third or fourth generation citizens, many of whom had, and I mentioned this earlier, ironically and shockingly <coughs> had family members, friends and neighbours fighting for the very country that was interning some of them. So what was the Australian experience? We were no exception and we had internment camps all over the country in both world wars. The biggest of those were in New South Wales and one of the smallest was on Torrens Island in the mouth of the Port River. The Torrens Island internment camp opened on the 9th of October 1914, same day that the war started, and was known as the Torrens Island Concentration Camp. That was its proper title. It was to Torrens Island that most of the internees from the Marossa Valley were initially sent. We're fortunate to know quite a bit about that camp because a professional photographer, Paul Dubotsky, and a boxer turned diarist, Frank von Garden, were interned there. Dubotsky, with the photographic equipment he was able to take into the camp, took hundreds of photos of the daily life of the internees. Now, I was supposed to be able to show you a picture of it. However, I have a, um, a Mac, Apple Mac uh, computer, and Ian doesn't, and we were not able to transfer that photograph onto his site. But, but out of the nine pictures that I'm going to show you, uh, we've been able to do six of them, so that's not too bad. So I apologise in advance for the ones I can't show you. However, the, the Torrens Island internment camp photographs are very easily accessible. You just have to Google them, and, and they are amazing. He, he took hundreds of photographs. Very, very interesting. It was an ex exhibition of his work at the Barossa Regional Gallery several years ago that inspired me to write my book, which is historic fiction, not about the camp as such, but about the families and communities that the internees left behind them and the impact that that had on those communities. The camps were run by the military and the conditions of the internees depended a great deal on the humanitarian, or otherwise, tendencies of the commandants. The commandant of Torrens Island camp in the early stages of World War I was a sadist. Captain George E. Hawkes, a 37-year-old former bank teller from Glenelg, who mistreated the men badly and brutally. It came to a head in 1915 and he was replaced, but the camp was closed soon afterwards and the remaining internees, remember most of them were from the Barossa Valley, were sent to New South Wales thousands of miles from their families and communities, just for being of German descent. An inquiry was held into Hawke's behaviour and he was exonerated. The facts are difficult to verify as the official records were, surprise, surprise, destroyed. More than 90% of internees in World War I were of German or Prussian, as they were often referred to, descent. The remainder were unfortunate from other places in Europe who the bureaucracy thought were dangerous aliens, especially if they could speak German. Internment camps were about containing a particular national or ethnic group, including thousands of innocent civilians, whereas prisoner war camps, on the other hand, were prisons for captured enemy service personnel. So who were these so-called Germans? The first Germans arrived in the First Fleet in 1778 and by 1900 were the fourth largest European group after the English, Scottish and Irish in Australia. German intellectuals, explorers such as Leichhardt and von Müller, scientists such as Schomburg and Strelow, musicians like Karl Linger who wrote the music to the Song of Australia, these educated immigrants proliferated and often gained prominence in Australian society in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
In South Australia, the Barossa Valley had the largest group of residents of German ancestry, some arriving as early as 1838, settling first in Klimzig and Harndorf, and a smaller wave coming to the Barossa Valley in 1848. And that, as I've said, consisted of intellectuals, scientists, and outspoken Democrats who were dissatisfied with the lack of political reform and freedom in Germany. And ironically, they had opted to live in a country that promised them constitutional democracy and progress towards their ideal of a unified state. How ironic is that? In the 1850s, German Australians were granted the right to vote and stand for Parliament. And in 1857, Friedrich Krischauf became the first legislator in South Australia of German descent. In 1842, Lutheran missionaries living in Adelaide, Christian Teichelmann and Klammer Sherman, both from Dresden, undertook to record the Gauna language for the first time in written form and described many Gauna cultural activities. Their work has proved invaluable and fund a fundamental resource for the Gauna people today in, the res in their resurrection of their language. A third wave was associated with the gold rush in the 1850s and 60s, and German immigrants made up about 10% then of our state's population by the early 20th century. So were particularly affected by the massive exodus of their menfolk in World War I. On the 10th of August 1914, all so-called Germans living in Australia were called on to report to their nearest police station, as I said, it was the beginning of the end of the once prosperous and proud German Australian community. <clears throat> On October the 29th of that year, the Commonwealth Parliament passed the War Precautions Act, conferring on the government and military a wide range of powers which described 81 separate offences and a bewildering collection of rules, orders and prohibitions, such as forbidding the ownership of cars, telephones, cameras, or homing pigeons. And I think we've got a photo and notice there, have we? <coughs> Which one? Yeah. First one? Yeah. 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 This is the sort of thing that was shown and posted all over the place. This is what people were seeing. And, and so it's not surprising that attitudes to the German people, wherever they were, and this is still going on today in, in relation to people of other ethnic uh, minorities, that kind of propaganda was very rife during World War I. Um, and so that's what the people of German descent had to put up with. Thank you, Ian. Many small businesses were boycotted and closed. Farms and vineyards were run down and schools closed. The onus of keeping the small Barossa communities going with such a drastic loss of mainly able-bodied men folk um, meant that the women and girls, old men and young boys, took up roles they were often ill-suited or fit for in an often hostile environment. And just as a plug, that's the sort of background of my novel. Economically, the remaining citizenry of the Barossa Valley not only had the common fears and concerns of the rest of the state's population, but they also had the loss, the death or maiming of loved ones in Australia's armed forces, also added to the loss of those who had been forcibly interned. The speaking of the local form of German, which was Barossa Deutsch, was forbidden in schools, in churches, anywhere. And all clubs and associations disbanded and gatherings made illegal. All the German cultural traditions, their newspapers, choral groups, cultural groups, entertainment, thank you. And Lutheran services in churches and the teaching and learning in German schools was prohibited. Most of the schools were closed down. The decision to intern was often perfunctorily based on a person's profession or family, and most were falsely identified and labelled as dangerous. <coughs> 
Over 3,400 people were imprisoned in Australia during World War I for, apart from being of German descent, amongst other things, spreading rumours, wearing a soldier's uniform without permission, selling Red Cross property, and hiding a journal. Bizarre. By October 1916, the registration regulations were extended to all aliens, whether enemy or not, and they included pacifists, unionists, radical socialists, Irish nationalists, anti-conscriptionists, and practically anybody else who dared to speak out against the government's commitment to the war. The German people were portrayed as monsters, as I showed you in that picture, that is now galling and embarrassing in its crudity and its racism. Many of the Barossa towns had names of German origin, as you well know, and these were changed to the names of the battle sites of the war. Verdun, formerly Gruntal, Luz, formerly Buchfeld, Nigola, Bloomberg to Birdwood, Petersburg to Peterborough, Handorf to Ambleside, and Rosenthal to Rosedale. Oh, and Rhine Villa to Cambrai. Very few reverted back to their original names at the war's end in 1918. By the end of World War II, the German community was further demoralised and the only traces of their once thriving community was their surnames, still very predominant in Barossa Valley, uh, phone book, which I used, by the way, to get many of the names for my book. Fortunately, however, an active cultural and language group of Barossa descendants called the Café und Kuchen meet in Tenanda once a month on Monday and a newly formed German language association hoped to bring the language back to the area and have it taught in local schools, and I hope that happens. This group has a wide email network and its own newsletter. The Lutheran Church survived both wars and still runs many local churches, schools, and community groups throughout Barossa and Gora as well. A prominent local politician who was a British not of German descent, represented the electorate of Barossa during World War I and was a Gorda resident and one-time editor of its paper, The Bunyan. This was Ephraim Henry Coombe. Coombe was one of the very few politicians at the time who saw through the injustices and hypocrisy of the internment process. He was an active anti-conscriptionist and both in and outside Parliament publicly defended those being persecuted for their German heritage and particularly criticised the closure of the Lutheran schools. And I think we have a picture of Coop. You're going to hear a lot more in detail about him from Helen Hennessy in May, but I can't write about what happened to Germans during World War I without referring to him. His memorial, still to be seen in Tenanda, was installed in 1930 by the grateful citizens of the Barossa. Three of his sons fought in World War I. One was killed, one badly injured, and however, that didn't stop him being prosecuted under the War Precautions Act and fined £10 for denouncing conscription. It is widely believed that his premature death at the age of 58 was partly due to the stress of this gross injustice and humiliation. You'll hear a lot more about this great gentleman, as I've said, from Helen in May. Helen and uh, Patricia Booth's uh, biography on him. I think it is worthwhile here to quote part of the inscription on his memorial. Quote, we crowned him in 1901, and all that is evil in man crucified him in 1917. But truth prevailed, and he died as he lived, an honourable man. These are strong sentiments, I'm sure you'll agree, still held over a decade after his death. There were so many similar anomalies. In South Australia, the German consul, Hermann Mook, was briefly interned during 1916 in South Australia and subsequently detained in his home under military guard at the same time that his youngest son, Francis, was serving with the AIF in France after being wounded at Gallipoli. By the end of World War I, a total of 6,150 internees, a mass deportation, unparalleled in Australian history, were forcibly deported to Germany and elsewhere, often as displaced persons with no existing links to their new destinations. 
many of their families here never saw again. The history of the Valley's experience during World War II is not surprisingly somewhat different. Germany's role, and particularly that of the Nazi Party, was very far-reaching and travel and international communication far quicker and easier than it had been 20 years earlier. Both were a real threat to the democratic world, a whole new ball game. Unlike in World War I, a combination of Japanese, Italian and German nationals were interned during the Second World War. Many were sent to Australia by the Allies in Europe. I mentioned earlier the Daniera boys, as they were called. In 1940, by a cruel twist of fate, a British troop ship, the Daniera, brought over 2,000 mainly German-Jewish male refugees to Australia who were fleeing Nazi persecution. Among them were physicists, musicians, and many academics who were treated appallingly on the journey to Australia. The military personnel who treated them so barbarically on board the Daniera were later court-martialed. Winston Churchill, on hearing about this terrible incident, described it as, and I quote, a deplorable and regrettable mistake. These men spent the rest of the war treated slightly better in Australia as internees in Hay, New South Wales. A TV series was made about their story some years ago. Many of them settled in Australia on release at War's End, and one became a professor at the University of Sydney. Of the estimated 20,000 native-born Germans in South Australia at the break of World War II, only 21 were ever interned, and only 300 in total in the other states, far fewer than in World War I. Most internees who were German nationals had arrived since 1923 and included many who were still Germany, German army reservists. So they'd fought in, for the Germans in World War I and then had come to Australia in the early 1920s. The bulk of World War II internees and POWs were of Italian descent or Japanese and the camps were at Keswick Barracks on Anzac Highway and Sandy Creek near the Barossa where mainly Italians were held. This camp was later taken over in 1942 as a barracks for the US Army's 32nd Infantry Division. And the attorneys sent to specially built camps at Loveday near Barmra on the River Murray, where most of the Italians were allowed to work on local farms. By the early 1930s, small groups of the newly arrived Germans, as well as a few whose families had lived in the valley for generations, were following the rise of Hitler with, ironically again, great admiration for his anti-Semitic and other racist theories. A far-right organisation called the Australia First Movement, embracing Nazi theories, was founded in the early 1930s in Sydney. One of its first members being Adela Pankhurst of the famous suffragette family. And if you want to know what she looked like, you'll be able to see it. This movement quickly took hold in small pockets of the Barossa Valley, mainly to Nanda, not long afterwards. It was always a secret group which had, fortunately, been successfully infiltrated by spies inserted by the Australian military. Most of these spies were of German descent and so accepted by the clandestine groups they infiltrated. One of these spies, Louis Alfred Tepper, reported on widespread support for Hitler, including parties held to celebrate his birthday. And we've got a photograph of that, I think, too. <coughs> he celebrated his 50th birthday uh, in 1945. Sorry, 1939, I beg your pardon. Um, just in April, so not long before World War II started. Tepper reported that a wartime Nazi cell operated in Tanunda which was generally identified as the centre of Nazi sympathisers in the Barossa. However, he never penetrated the cell, and in a book edited by Peter Monteith, which is entitled Germans, Travellers, Settlers and Their Descendants in South Australia, 
Queensland writer Barbara Farnitsky states in her chapter entitled National Socialism in South Australia that it was probably the remnant of Johannes Becker's Volksdeutsch propaganda group from the 1930s. Farnitsky, an expert in the German language, has a PhD on the impact of Nazism in Australia. So who was this Johannes Heinrich Becker? An interesting cameo of this period is the role he played. He was a World War I German Army veteran who arrived in Australia in 1927 and settled in Tanunda. He was a medical practitioner who hadn't been an Australian resident long enough to have his qualifications recognised, but he practised in the valley just the same. At the time, he was one of just two known Nazi sympathisers in Australia, but by 1931, there was a push from the Reichstag in Germany for Nazi party branches to be formed around the world. Becker was contacted by Dr. Hans Nieland of Hamburg, and he became a Nazi party member in 1932 and persuaded a dozen or so other newly arrived Germans to join. Becker is also purported to be the man who controlled the Gestapo in Australia, according to Podesky, and set up a club for further education, which was the cover for the Nazi propaganda group. Becker's group excluded those who were called the Volksdeutsche. They're the ones who had arrived almost 100 years earlier. He was more interested in new arrivals. He returned to Germany in the early 1930s, where he met prominent Nazi officials, and on his return set out in 1934 to gain control of the main German institution in South Australia, the German club. But the club tried to refuse admission to members of international political parties. However, Becker succeeded in overturning the ban and his group took control. Becker soon became the senior Nazi party representative in Australia to the point where the German Consul General had to ask him for approval from the consulate before, it could, could, before sorry, the consulate could issue passports. In Australia, Gestapo representatives operated as part of the Haftendienst, or Harbour Service, responsible for looking after crews on German ships. Becker appointed William Wilhelm Heiler, head of the Nazi party in Melbourne, as head of this group, who answered directly to him. Information was then passed on to the Gestapo in Germany. Ponevsky discovered a report of a sailor who was jailed in Germany for being overheard to make a disparaging anti-Nazi remark in a hotel in Tanunda. Many of those who joined Becker did so often under duress or blackmail. His activities earned him the enmity of much of the old Barossa German community. Many local Germans became naturalised Australians to make themselves ineligible to join, so the branch remained tiny in South Australia. But for a time, Becker was still able to ensure that South Australian agencies for German exports went to Nazi sympathisers. A leading member of the Hitler Youth, Gotthard Amelan, visited the Tanunda and Brisbane branches of the party in October 1936. But by December of that year, the Adelaide, Tanunda and Brisbane branches of the party were dissolved. He was, to say the least, disappointed that Nazism hadn't taken a stronger hold as Becker might have wished, and is recorded as saying with the same measure of sarcasm, and this is to quote this Gotthard Avila, the party had been dissolved and Germanism delivered from the unholy workings of Dr Becker. During the war, Becker was interned and imprisoned in Gladstone Jail. He was paroled in 1946, and in November 1947, he was discovered trying to stow away on a ship bound for Panama, lying off Watson's Bay near Sydney, and was deported the following month to West Germany. He applied for re-entry to Australia over the years, but was refused. His wife and family remained in South Australia and the marriage was eventually dissolved. 
He was investigated for his involvement in the Nazi movement after arriving in West Germany, but the charges were dropped because the dossier on his Australian activities had Mr. Finally <coughs> disappeared. Becker died in Germany in 1961. His son Heine, who still lives in South Australia, was a state Liberal MP for almost 30 years, and as far as I'm aware, is still alive, and now in his 80s. He has always maintained that his father was made a scapegoat. I think we've got a photo of Heine somewhere. From the late 1920s onwards, the Nazi Party had continued to try and establish a presence in South Australia, but with little success, and issues became clouded as war drew near. Divisions ran deep in German families, where one member might demonstrate Nazi sympathies, to the horror of the rest of the family. Probably unsurprisingly over the years, the few who were involved in the Nazi infiltration of the Barossa Valley at that time chose to hide or denied their part in it. It is probable that the full horrors of Nazism were not realised by the Australian public generally, and that includes those of the Barossa, until the war was over. Barbara Fedevsky writes, and I quote, it should be remembered that many Germans in Australia died for their love and loyalty to their adopted country. Those who supported Germany while she was winning did a disservice to their descendants by denying this and leaving a legacy of resentment and paranoia. It would have been more dignified to have admitted their sentiments. Well, easier said than done. The experiences of those of German descent in each of the world wars were harrowing and markedly different for historic and political reasons. And those who either remember or have been told about those experiences are, unsurprisingly, more than happy to put them behind them. Someone once said, the first casualty of war is the truth. So maybe we will never know the whole truth about the Barossa German experience in either of the world wars. The official acknowledgement of what those, German dis of those of German descent had suffered during both world wars was late in coming, and it was not until as recently as September the 26th, 1999, that the then Governor-General of Australia, Sir William Dean, delivering the opening address to the inaugural Australian Conference on Lutheran Education, said, in part, to the members of the Australian German community present, and I quote him, the tragic and often shameful discrimination against Australians of German origin, fostered during the World Wars, had many consequences. No doubt, some, carry the emotional scars of injustice during those times as part of family histories. Let me, as Governor-General, say to all who do, how profoundly sorry I am that such things happened in our country. This little man apology invites reflection on a number of issues, and particularly in the context of the privileged role, for example, that the Anzac story has in our military history. The story of the German-Australian community during both world wars offers an alternative view of our war history as a nation. Not just of individual grief and loss, but also the collective loss incurred when a significant community in South Australia was traumatised and divided. <coughs> Okay, well thank you very much there. I can see by the uh, numbers of people coming tonight, it's obviously it's a subject you either know a little bit about, a lot about, or absolutely nothing. I'd probably sit at the, the lower scale. The only things I've seen, I think, at the Sandy Creek pub, and I happen to be there not drinking, was a plaque, I think, from the American, was it 52nd? 32nd? 32nd on the wall there, whether it's still there or disappeared over time, and I think there's a place called Barrett's Road up there as well, which is linked as well, so that's my some knowledge, so thank you very much. Now I'll pass over to young Helen Hennessy, and you've mentioned also a link to Helen's upcoming talk in uh, May, History Week, so I'll ask Helen to give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Judy. Um, oh, yeah, apparently we're going to have to move here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I 
In, in passing on of your thanks for a very balanced and wide-ranging, I think um, I would like to echo Cody's words. This story is not unique. It's not unique in Australia, and it's not unique to that time. It is very easy when we get into any type of conflict to demonise the others. And I wonder if the circumstances were the same, whether we wouldn't do that, the same thing again today. So, as we're always with history, we have to learn from where we've been and think about it and reflect. Um, and this is a topic that does obviously come to Gawler because of Coombs as well. But um, you and I have both been up to the cuff for Cathy and Cook, and, um, and, and I was there with Patricia, my co author, on Monday. And there were people there in their 80s and 90s who shared their life stories with me, and the trauma still exists. You don't have to you don't have to scratch hard for those stories to come out of what happened to their parents and their grandparents and in one case to a very elderly gentleman what his school life was in was like in the Barossa as a result of World War Two. So it's a interesting and sometimes harrowing part of our, our history, but thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Don't run away. <laughs> Somewhere behind here, thank you. We have Oh my goodness. A goodie basket for you and Dave. Thank you very much. He's not getting He's going to have to carry it. Um, can I ask everyone to uh, give their further thanks to Judy for an excellent